بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمد ونشكر ونستعين ونستغفر ونتوب إليه ونشهد إن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد محمد عبده ورسوله رب الشرح لي صدري والسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من نساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم So the topic Treating the teens or treating our teens as adults Brevity in speaking I think it's very interesting that that's the, the topic that I've been asked to speak about. Because when we think of brevity in speaking, we as adults are currently living in a world where everything is about being instantaneous. Where we ourselves have very short attention spans. You know, when I speak about marriage, I often reference a, uh, a movie called Jerry Maguire. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that movie. In that movie, there's a line where the female lead actress comes in and she looks at the male and she says, you had me at hello. Now, when we talk to teens, it's often, you lost me at hello. As soon as we begin speaking, there's a little off button that turns off and it's like the ears sometimes shut down. Why? What is happening in our communication with our teenagers, whether they're our children, our students, or the teens who surround us? What is happening that's causing this rift in communication where there seems to be a lack of understanding or a lack of connection? So my field is communication. And I know growing up, as I studied communication at college, and people would ask me, what is your major? And I would say communication. They would all say, isn't that common sense? Like you study how to talk to people? But the reality is that communication takes a lot more than just common sense, particularly when we are communicating with our children. When I say the word tree, what comes to mind? What type of a tree do you think of? Just shout out the types of trees that you think of. Oak tree, palm tree, maple tree. I think I heard apple tree somewhere there, willow tree. Did I hear a Christmas tree? I don't know. <laughs> um, right, all sorts of different trees, right? That we'll talk about another time, okay? Um, all sorts of different trees. Because I said tree, and the type of tree I was thinking of was a willow tree. But when I communicated to you the word tree, each of you selected to understand that word tree based on your own understanding, your own worldview, your own way of seeing the world. Maybe you grew up in a land that had palm trees, and so you thought of a palm tree. Maybe you grew up in a place that had an apple tree, and so you thought of an apple tree. Maybe you know, you, you're thinking of the holidays that are coming up, and it's Easter, and so you thought of a Christmas tree. So whatever your worldview is, is how you interpret the way that someone communicates. Our children are no different. Our teenagers are no different. Our teenagers are living in a world where laugh out loud is too long to say, so they say LOL. Where be right back is shortened to BRB. Where talk to you later is TTYL. Where I love you is just a smiley face, right? We are living in a world where communication has become shortened. Why? Because of that sense of instant gratification. And so when we speak to our teens and we speak to them in our language, the tree that they are seeing may be very different than the tree that we are referencing. Again, whenever I give the marriage talks and the marriage lectures, I usually begin with the ayah from the Quran, from Surah Al-Rum, which is known as the marriage verse. And it is verse 20 which speaks about, the verse 21, I'm sorry, that speaks about mawadda wa rahma, care and mercy. Now what's really interesting is when you look at that verse, the verse that precedes it and the verse that follows it has beautiful meaning for us to understand in terms of communication within our families, not just our marriages. And so the verse that precedes that marriage verse is a verse that speaks of how we are created from a diversity, from all different places. And the verse that follows it speaks to us as how we are created with different colors, speaking different tongues. And the term that is used in the Quran is lisan. And although you may see translations of it as language, the lisan actually means tongue.
And we see that even in referencing the Quran, we are told that it, was, it came to us in lisanun arabiyun, in the Arabic tongue. What is the difference between a tongue and a language? The tongue is the difference in how we interpret and understand. So when we speak English, we may think that our children are speaking the same language as us. They're speaking English as well. But when they speak to us with that LOL, that TTYL, that BRB, sometimes it seems like a t completely different language. But it's a different tongue. A tongue that as teenagers, they have developed in order to feel connected with one another. And although, as the brother who was introducing us was mentioning, that we will see generation after generation lamenting that their children are so different than they were at that age, that their children are not as respectful, their children are just not as active, they're not as motivated. We see that the difference from generation to generation is one that is cyclical, that will continue with every coming generation as well. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu reminded us, do not raise this generation as you were raised. For every generation has different obstacles and different problems. And every generation has a different tongue with which they speak. I know when I was growing up, it was back in the 80s, and it was the era of Michael Jackson. So when we were growing up, there was a song that Michael Jackson used to sing, which was called Bad. Anyone from the 80s probably remembers it. And we would walk around as teenagers, my sisters and I, and everything that was cool, we'd say, oh, that's bad. That's so bad. And I remember it would drive my parents crazy because they'd say, you know what, if it's good, call it good. If it's bad, call it bad. Why would you call it bad if it's good? And this was our lisan at that time. It was the tongue with which we spoke. But when we speak to our children, and we try so hard to reach them with our tongue, with our lisan, but we are not reaching them. What do we do? This is where we need to stop and ask ourselves how else can we reach our children? And it's not always with our tongue, but it's often with what we don't say. It's often with the non-verbals. What do our actions show our children? In expressing love to our children, do we speak to them in a lisan that they understand, in a language they understand? Again, a lot of what we do in marriage counseling we find applies to the family as well and parent-child relationships. In marriage counseling, we look at the five languages of love and we see that there is a difference in the way we interact with one another and the way that we feel love and exhibit love and in the way that we feel loved. Our children are no different. They may speak the language of gifting, the language of touch, the language of time, the language of service, or the language of affirmation. What do those five mean? If, as a parent, I speak the language of service, I may be excited, my child is coming home, I know they've had a long day at school, they've had a hard test, and I cook a full meal for them and I clean their room and I set up their items nicely and the child comes home and kind of throws themselves on the couch and you turn to your child and you say, you're so ungrateful. I cooked this meal for you. I cleaned your room for you. I set up all these items. You're so ungrateful. And yet, as a parent speaking the language of service, I may have felt that I showed my love to my child by cooking, by cleaning, by washing by doing acts of service, by picking up and dropping off. But if my child speaks the language of affirmation, what they need in that moment is to hear, I love you. What they need in that moment is to hear, you're amazing. I know you had a hard day, but I'm here for you. Because if they don't speak that language of service, they're not going to feel loved in that moment. And the lisan is different. If a child speaks the language of touch, but you speak the language of time, you as a parent may tell the child, sit here, look me in the eye when I speak to you, put your phone down, show some respect, spend time with your parents. But if the child speaks the language of touch, a hug, a pat on the hand, a touch of the cheek, may be what they need in that moment more than spending three hours at the dinner table with you. 
These are the differences in language. Yet so often we get so wrapped up in believing that our way is the right way, that there is something wrong with our children, that they must be damaged, that we don't stop and ask, what can I do differently? What can I change in my methods of tarbiyah? When we look at the relationship between the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sittina Fatima radiallahu anha, we see that that process of tarbiyah begins from that young age and carries through so that when the teenage years come, that connection between parent and child is solidified. But we look at the language that's used between the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sittina Fatima radiallahu anha, and we see how that connection grew. From a young age, when Sittina Fatima radiallahu anha would enter upon the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would stand from his seat and ask her to sit in his place. He would kiss her on the forehead. He would show her that love in his actions and in his way of connecting non-verbally. And when the time came when the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was prostrating in prayer upon a hilltop. And Sittina Fatima radiallahu anha, who was around the age of 11 or 12, standing before the door of her home, saw the kuffar circle around the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and reach into a dead camel and pull out the guts and the filth of the dead camel and throw it upon the back of the beloved Prophet of Allah. The tears began to stream down her face as she hurried up the hill towards her father. And she removed the filth from his back as he continued to pray. And she sat beside him. When the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam completed his prayer, he turned to his beloved Fatima, who had earned the nickname Umm Abiha, the mother of her father for caring so much for her father and for taking care of him. He turned to his beloved daughter and he did not tell her, go back to the home, you shouldn't be here. He didn't tell her this isn't a place for a girl. He wiped her tears and he kissed her on the forehead. And he told her, do not be sad, for surely our Lord will allow your father to be victorious. He spoke to her with brevity. He spoke to her with kindness. He spoke to her with compassion. He spoke to her with empathy, with understanding. He spoke to her non-verbally and verbally. And this is how we connect with our children. This is how we connect with our teens in order to raise them with a sense of security and a sense of confidence to know that they are loved, to know that they are worthy, to know that they are important to us, to know that they are listened to and that they are heard. Because when our teens turn off their ears and decide not to listen to us anymore, it is likely because they feel that they have not been listened to. It is likely because they feel that their words sound like a foreign language to you. And the truth is, it probably does. Because we don't always take the time to learn the lisan of our children, to understand what they're saying, not just with their tongue, but with their eyes, with their time, with who they surround themselves with. And so before we are so quick to point a finger and say our teenagers are rebelling, our teenagers have a crisis of faith, our teenagers have a crisis of adab, we first need to stop and look at the three fingers that are pointing back at us and ask ourselves as parents, how are we communicating? How are we connecting? Are we reaching our children? Do we understand their tongue? Jazakum Allahu khair. Assalamu alaikum.